welcome to our first speaker series of the new year. Uh, those of you who have been to the speaker series know that we usually have one speaker, um, but because of the nature of the uh, debate that we're going to talk about tonight, we have two speakers. Uh, so we'll have more of a conversation than a presentation. Uh, we're joined by UCLA, UCLA professors uh, Glenn McDonald uh, and John Christensen. Uh, who recently found themselves at the center of a debate over the importance of and relevance of the legacy of John Muir. Muir is largely seen as the patron saint of environmentalism. He became famous for saving Yosemite and influencing countless preservation movements across the U.S. However, it's 100 years since his death and times have changed. So the question becomes, is his legacy still relevant? Before I turn it over to both Glenn and John, let me tell you a little bit about them. Glenn McDonald is the John Muir Chair, Memorial Chair of Geography and a UCLA Distinguished Professor. He is a former UC Presidential Chair and former Director of the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. His research focuses on climate change, its causes and its impact on the environment and society. John Christensen Christensen is an adjunct pro assistant professor in the, at, in the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, Department of History, and the Center for Digital Humanities at UCLA. He is currently finishing a book titled Critical Habitat, A History of Thinking with Things in Nature. He is engaged <coughs> in multi multidisciplinary digital environmental humanities research project on nature in cities, as well as a large collaborative project to crowdsource a new public environmental history of the San Francisco Bay Area. Welcome, thank you thank for you. being here. It's a pleasure. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Glenn and John and have them give you a presentation uh, before we get into the discussion. Well, thank you very much. I, I wanna thank Claire and I wanna thank the Manzanita Institute and School for inviting us here. It's, it really is a pleasure and thank you all for coming out this evening. I'm not sure we're going to duke it out too much, but I think that we hope to stimulate some, some thinking and critical thinking and, and good thinking and, and discussion and debate. So, so welcome and, and, and let's do that. I, I want to say a few things about Muir, the context. What's happened in the hundred years since, since he passed away? And, uh, and what, what I think are, are some valid criticisms and what are the things we should still bring forward from his legacy that can serve us well in the 21st century? Now, for those of you who didn't know, John Muir died in Los Angeles. He died in Los Angeles Christmas Eve in uh, 1914. He was visiting his daughter here. And when he died, he uh, was working on a, on a manuscript about Alaska. We in California associate him very much with the Sierras, but he was really fascinated by Alaska and, and went there on a number of occasions. Now, the question is, 100 years after John Muir died, mm -hmm. We have a lot of schools named after him, parks and things like that. We've probably read snippets, maybe some of us have read My First Summer in the Sierra. He is a prodigious writer, probably no one here has written, read everything that, that, he, that he wrote. Uh, but he has a deep Im impact on us, whether we quoting him or we're just thinking about ideas that he put forward and that then became how Americans um, define nature and how we define conservation and how we go about doing it. But a lot has changed. And, and let's just look at that a little bit to understand what a different world we're in. When Muir was writing, uh, there were about three million people in California. Now, it was the most populous of the western states, of course, but imagine that. That's less than a tenth of the number of people in the state today. And uh, by 2050, <coughs> we're anticipating there'll be some 50 million people in the state. The pressures on these wildland environments that he so treasured, these environments that were, you know, untr un not untrammeled, but were unchanged by human activity, uh, is immense. And whether he could have imagined a state that would have had an order of magnitude more people in it, I I'm not really sure. When we look at, then, the places that he well, thought was sacred, in a sense, um, Yosemite, of course, immediately comes to mind. Now. It wasn't until the 1950s and 60s till the visitorship to Yosemite rose to the millions of people. It certainly wasn't anything like that in Muir's day. And it reached a peak of over four million people in the 1990s. And then actually has descended a bit. 
and, and for various reasons. But we're still seeing close to four million visitors a year and much of that concentrated in the Yosemite Valley. This is just a picture of tourism at Muir's time. Remember Muir initially made a living as a guide there, as a naturalist guiding tourists there. This was part and parcel of, of how he kept body and soul together. Now as a scientist, Muir was an interesting fellow. He's known both in botany and in geology. And of course he's known for having won the debate against Whitney, who was the state geologist, about the glacial origins of the Yosemite Valley. <clears throat> he's also famous for finding the first living glacier in the Sierra Nevada. And uh, the fact of the matter is that that glacier has disappeared now. And the glaciers in the Sierra Nevada, due to climate change, we were predicting somewhere between five degrees Fahrenheit winter warming and seven degrees Fahrenheit summer warming. Those glaciers are disappearing. When they will all disappear, it's uncertain. But there is the potential that every single glacier in the Sierra Nevada will disappear. And the Black Mountain Glacier, the one that, that Muir discovered, uh, is already gone. As climate is warming in the 21st century, and again, this is something Muir could not have anticipated, the life zones, the vegetation that he treasured, the high alpine vegetation, potentially will be replaced by forested vegetation. Lower elevation forests will potentially be replaced by other vegetation types, and there will be a huge change in the Sierra Nevada. The environment itself in the Sierra is changing. The giant sequoia groves, which Muir so treasured, and he wrote and published scientific articles about how they came to their distribution, which he felt was a relic of glaciation. We now believe that they are very, very tightly controlled by climate and by the level of the inversion layer over the uh, Central Valley. As that changes, the life zone that they live in may disappear, and also they are very susceptible to pathogens under warm temperatures. Muir planted one in his uh, home in Martinez. They're trying to clone that now because it can't survive under warm temperatures. Mm -hmm. The vegetation he loved could disappear. But there's more profound things happening than that in terms of our capacity to cope with preservation and conservation of the environment, with climate change, uh, with the challenges that we face. And that is uh, our fiscal capacity. Muir um, was a great believer in the role of the federal government for preserving the nature he treasured so much, hence his, his push to the Park Service. And yet, when you look at Muir's time, 1914, our federal debt stood at about 4% of the gross domestic product. Today, it's at 70% of the gross domestic product. The appetite, and some could argue the capacity of the government, whether at the state or the federal level, for big projects, for big initiatives, to face the big challenges that climate change is putting on uh, environment, may have passed. It's certainly a very different world. You have members of the uh, Congress calling for the sale of some national park lands and things like that, questioning whether the federal government should own any, any park lands, and you have just stark economic facts that our debt ratio is so much higher than it was in Muir's time. Muir could also be said to be the author of some of the difficulties we're facing in conservation in California, particularly in the Sierra Nevada. He, um, an, on one level, understood that Native peoples had been robbed of their lands and at a sort of a theoretical level understood that. But in his writings, particularly for California Indians, he's not particularly complimentary. And he certainly didn't pay much attention to their role in ecosystems in terms of fire and set fires and keeping Yosemite Valley clear of vegetation that provided the, the meadows and things like that, which provided these fantastic views. What we're seeing then is he and Gordon Pinchot put into place the smoky bear idea, keep fire out. That has led then to a buildup of fuel, buildup of pathogens, and really severe challenges to the forest of the Sierra Nevada that he loved so much. Now that uh, Smokey the Bear philosophy has been put aside, but the cost of forest thinning is just unbelievably high. And so we will have these large, huge fires, which Muir would have been abhorred by, but in, in, in a sense, he was partially the author for the forest management pro, uh, uh, programs we had in the 20th century. Muir also 
he had a very dissected view of the state or of the of the sort of land surface in which is there were farmlands, there was you know, agricultural fields, areas where you had resource extraction of one sort or the other. Typically, thought, and this is his, his farm, his ranch in uh, Martinez. Then there were wildland areas, the, you know, the Sierra Nevada, where you went to get away from all of that. And then there were the cities. Now, he didn't really write glowingly about cities, but he spent much of his life living in San Francisco. And, uh, and so, uh, but he, we still carry that with us, and maybe John will speak about more about that. We don't, it, we don't see nature all around us, and we maybe don't feel we're part of nature because nature for Muir was a place you went to and discovered elsewhere. Now, this may be that um, um, the town that he was born in grew up until he was 11 in Scotland was a rather bleak place and surrounded mainly by barley fields and things like that. Um, and, you know, the city of Los Angeles and San Francisco, perhaps in the uh, early 20th century, maybe weren't that compelling. But if you, if you go back and look at late 19th century, early 20th century, Los Angeles and San Francisco, there was green space. There was nature there, but he never really celebrates it. And yet this is a way to connect people with the environment, with nature. It's interesting to read Muir and look for his comments on the Californinos, the Mexican Americans, people of Hispanic or Latino background in California. It's pretty much absent. Pretty much doesn't see it. His audience and what he sees are typically white, Anglo, European, uh, uh, Californians and Americans and, and Europeans. And his choir that he preached to were powerful. And they were the powerful, politically powerful and, and uh, economically powerful. And they were, they were principally white. And uh, you, know, you only see glimpses. He talks about Los Angeles at one point and says, you know, where you see adobes, cheek and jowl with uh, clapboard houses. He doesn't talk about the people living there. And you wonder what, what he thought or made of that. But the fact of the matter is the demography of the nation is changing. And organizations such as the Sierra Club, Nature Conservancy, reflect in general a white demographic and an older demographic. Mm -hmm. National park visitation reflects that. A 2009 study shows that 78% of the visitors to the nation's national parks were white. This is a time when 64% of the population were white. African American Hispanics are greatly underrepresented the figures are almost exactly the same for California, despite the fact we even have a larger uh, Hispanic population than the rest of the nation. About 77% of park visitorship is white. What's even more troubling is a survey was done about attitudes towards National Park Service, and um, by two to three times as much, people of color, Hispanic, African American people, felt uncomfortable with National Park Service facilities and uh, structure, whereas it was just a minuscule percentage that felt that way uh, amongst uh, Anglos. That's very interesting and something we have to confront. The demography of the nation is changing. We know the demography of the state is changing. We will be a, a, a plurality and a majority Hispanic as we move through this century. Why the disconnect then uh, from, from parks, and please don't say it's because these people don't care about conservation. They don't care about environment. Uh, polls show Hispanics, Latinos, have a much stronger commitment uh, to environmental issues uh, than uh, average uh, uh, Anglo-American. So we really have some work to do there, and there's a whole group of people Muir just didn't seem to see, and probably don't feel that he's speaking to them, unfortunately. Muir also wrote a lot about being alone out in nature, being out there, you know, you're out, you're on your own. You're like the typical backpacker doing the Pacific Crest tra Trail by yourself. And later on, we can discuss why I think he did that. But the fact of the matter is, lots of groups, nature is a shared experience. And it's a place that you want to do things with your family, with your friends. And the model that you have to go conquer it alone, far away from everything else, 
that may be not that good. And if you look at numbers of backcountry backpackers in things like Yosemite, you see that it's small, or overnight visitors in Yosemite, you see that it's small. There are other ways to enjoy nature besides being <coughs> the, uh, the sole lonely uh, uh, person there. Now, we can look at some things he did do, though. And you can't dispute this. National Park Service, as we know, it comes into existence in 1916. Of course, Yosemite was made a national park by his push. He wrote a great book on the national parks. He really was uh, instrumental, amongst other people, in getting that put up. In California, we have over 7 million, 500 ac uh, 7, uh, 7, uh, million acres of National Park Service land we can thank Muir for. Even Pinchot's U.S. Forest Service has put a great deal of land aside now uh, as wilderness areas. That's an indisputable legacy. When you actually get into Muir a little bit more, you see that he did lots of group activities. There was a lot of group uh, hikes. There were local group hikes. There were lots of things with the whole family and everybody else out into nature. I think we should celebrate that. He also was all about accessibility. When there was a debate about allowing cars into Yosemite, he came down on the side of let people come and enjoy nature. And so he wasn't exclusionary. Similarly on immigration, he wrote that the, 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 the state, the country should be open to everyone and that there should be space for everybody here. And Sierra Club has had an interesting history on that topic. He also understood the power of art in terms of changing people's views on nature. This is a picture from William Keith, a fellow Scot and his great friend. Um, he, Carlton Watkins, phot photographs of Yosemite. He understood, in a sense, the multimedia and the importance of emotion and reaching out to people. He also understood that, as much as we say he was this rigid preservationist in all of that, he understood that you had to make allies in the private sector and with political sector and things like that. In some ways, he probably leans a bit more towards Peter Kariva of the uh, Nature Conservancy than people would like to admit. But he really knew how to cajole and to play the, uh, play the angles on that. Now, we say then that he failed in his great fight the year before he died. Anyone know who this is? No, you don't. Good. William O'Shaughnessy. William O'Shaughnessy is the one who beat, in a sense, Muir for the O'Shaughnessy Dam and the damming of the Hetch Hetchy Valley. This is William O'Shaughnessy showing a map and it says San Francisco, X number acres of water for the city of the Hetch Hetchy Valley. No one knows who O'Shaughnessy is anymore. <laughs> Everybody knows who Muir is. He lost that battle, but in a sense, by showing us how to create an NGO like the um, Sierra Club, by showing us how to lobby and how to fight and how to try to stir up public reaction, even though he lost Hetch Hetchy, it's been argued that that was the model then for 20th century conservation and environmental activism. And that is a model that's not just um, uh, in the United States, but it's worldwide. This is a recent rally in Australia about protecting wilderness areas in Tasmania. And in a sense, I think that is part of Muir's legacy. I'm going to turn it over to John. We think of him as this crotchety, rigid old man. And he certainly had his faults. I'm not trying to, to, uh, to cover that up. But I would think we should think about what we need to take forward in the 21st century. Think about Muir as a young man who, at 33 years old, was sought out by 68, 69-year-old Ralph Waldo Emerson mm -hmm. to show him around Yosemite. A young man who could admire both as a gray, evolutionary biologist, great friend with Darwin, and Louis Agassiz, uh, geologist, father of the glacial theory, but a huge uh, critic of evolutionary theory. And then in that trinity, put in uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, of course, who probably thought both of those kinds of arguments were immaterial compared to the spiritual state of, of man. I think that if we take that open mind of how we define nature, how we look at nature, and that same open mind is how we look at Muir and his legacies, it will serve us well going forward.